It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. Rick Smith. So on Tuesday, Massachusetts Senator Ed Markey and Georgia Congressman Hank Johnson held a press conference to announce uh, legislation to expand the Supreme Court from the current nine to 13. Uh, The idea being the stated goal, restore legitimacy to the court. Can you believe we have to talk about this in this day and age? But here we are. Uh, Senator Markey uh, highlighted what he said was head spinning hypocrisy and called for undoing Republican thievery. Uh, hit a chord with me when he said, hey, don't don't agonize, organize. Don't get mad. Get to work. And that's why we've asked Senator Markey to come share some thoughts with us uh, on how maybe we move this forward. Senator, thanks for taking time for us. I'd love being with you. Thank you. So this is not this is not a new concept. Uh, it's happened you know, what, some 86 years ago. What are the chances this legislation is going to move and we're going to actually get some sanity into the court? What are the chances of this getting through? It's inevitable that it's going to move. And, and, and thank you for saying it's happened before. The, originally, the Supreme Court only had six members on it. It's determined by Congress, not by the Constitution. Uh, and Abe Lincoln actually expanded it to 10 seats. Uh, then it got reduced down to nine seats, which is where it's which is where it has been. Uh, so it's it's not nine forever etched into the United States Constitution. Uh, this is different. Uh, and what's happening, obviously, is that we're living right now in the aftermath of a political heist of two Supreme Court seats by Mitch McConnell and by Donald Trump uh, when. Uh, Antonin Scalia passed away, they developed a new policy saying, oh my goodness, we cannot confirm a new Supreme Court justice during a presidential year. So they kept the seat vacant for 430 days. Unbelievable. It was like eight, it was like eight seats for 430 days so that they could then put Gorsuch on after Trump won. Then this sacred doctrine goes right into the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So she passes away, and all of a sudden, in 30 days, right before the Trump re-election in 2020, they can confirm Amy Coney Barrett. 30 days, not 430 days. Right. So that's hypocrisy on stilts, and they swipe the two seats. Well, what are the consequences? Well, the repeal of Roe versus Wade. Um, reducing safety measures for gun laws. Um, And ultimately, all union rights will be on the table, uh, as will health, uh, as will safety laws. They're all going to be now on the table for a radical right wing six to three majority uh, in the Supreme Court. And what we need to do in order to rectify this heist is to increase the number of justices by four up to 13, and then that will restore the balance that otherwise would have existed if the Republicans had not stolen those seats. It would be seven, six, and then we can begin to restore precedent, restore um, some semblance of respect for uh, what our country has become and not this crazy nostalgia for a time that never existed that this Supreme Court majority now seeks to impose upon us something from 50 years ago, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. And ultimately, uh, I believe that every session of the Supreme Court coming up, by the way, just in June of this year, they're going to they're going to basically make five or six decisions. They're going to outrage the American people. Right. Then next June, they're going to do the same thing. And it's all going to build towards more and more members of the House and Senate signing on to the bill to expand the court. 
uh, and putting it on the ballot for 2024 as a big issue that all Americans are going to have to reckon with uh, as they're going into the the uh, the ballot box. Yeah, I think it's important, as you pointed out, there are a lot of big things that that get the attention. And, and when I talk to my conservative friends, you go, yeah, OK, fine, you're you're against the abortion rights. But all of these other things, all of this corporate stuff, the Roberts Court, in my view, probably the most most corporate court in the history of our country. Uh, I saw a thing the other day that said when the when the Chamber of Commerce uh, puts in a brief on any case, they win almost three quarter, more than three quarters of the time, upwards of 80 percent of the time they win. Uh, you know, you go through, you said union rights are on the t- chopping table, safe working conditions, all of this stuff that that applies to working people every day that never gets the headlines. Uh, and I think that's stuff that has to be pointed out as well. The entire 20th century is on the chopping block. Every single worker safety, job protection, union protection law is going to be on the table. They now have a home court advantage, a home Supreme Court advantage, uh, and they're going to win uh, every single time. Corporate yeah. America. Well, what do you say to this? Undermine those rights. What do you say to the argument? Look, you know, Senator, you know, the Republicans just played the game better. Uh, they out organized. They out funded. Uh, they for for decades have funded right wing think tanks and 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 media outlets and uh, uh, you know uh, the Federalist Society. They've got the infrastructure to build this this juggernaut. Uh, they've just done it better. What do you say to that argument? I say that we've got to do it better ourselves. That's why we have to expand the court. Now people say, well, that is unseemly. We shouldn't do that. My answer is when bullies steal your lunch money down the schoolyard, if you don't do anything about it, they're going to come back over and over and over again, stealing your lunch money. So we've got to fight back. And the way to fight back, the way to stand up to bullies uh, here uh, is to expand the court, to take back control that legitimately belongs in Democratic hands. Now, what's interesting to me, and I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a conservative who told me, you know, actually it was the night that Trump was elected. So it's going to be interesting watching liberals become states' rights people and and people learning just how important the Supreme Court is. And this was well before a lot of this stuff was in the headlines. And you look today, the anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision. You go in a couple of weeks, you're going to have the loving anniversary of the loving decision. All of this stuff that we take for granted that's popular in the public, that people want, this court could conceivably overturn in the coming years, as you, you know, weeks, months, and years, as you pointed out. We went 100 years after the Civil War thinking we had a 14th Amendment, a 15th Amendment. Uh, thinking that we had a a right to vote for all uh, blacks in our country. Didn't happen. It it took Martin Luther King Jr., took uh, people like Thurgood Marshall being put on the Supreme Court, who was the lead lawyer in Brown versus Board of Education, by the way, in 1953, uh, in order to begin to implement what the promise was uh, of the Civil War in terms of protecting the rights of minorities in our country. So, um, that's that's something that really sticks in the craw of uh, of these um, uh, of these very conservative, especially red state uh, Republicans who want to go back to a time before the civil rights movement. And so, if we're not uh, if if we're not going to fight, uh, then we're going to betray the legacy of all of those who stood up in the fifties and sixties yeah. uh, in order to continue to in order to expand procedural uh, and substantive due process in our country. And so that's our challenge right now, generationally. We're up. It's our time. We have to fight the same way uh, that those great leaders in the 60s fought. You listen to the Rick Smith Show. We're here with Senator Ed Markey. You want to check out his website, markey.senate.gov. We'll get links out on social media, how you can do that and maybe get involved in pushing. Don't be don't be agonizing, organizing. It's what we need to be doing. Now, here's the thing. You've been in the Senate for, for number of years you've been in government for quite a number of years we keep hearing this word conservative being thrown out these are not these are not my grandparents conservatives these folks right now are radicals who want to completely change uh the face of this country into a corporatocracy or an oligarchy however you want to frame that and i think it's important that we we start calling this kind of stuff out in in very loud ways 
Exactly right. Conservative really means in the traditional sense that you respect um, precedent. You respect uh, what has happened in the past. All we have to look at is the Dobbs decision. You're repealing Roe versus Wade. That was a 49 year old precedent uh, that our country had come to accept as the law of the land. But Alito, all of them, they they really don't care. It was it was pre packaged. They were going to repeal it. And there's a lot more that they're going to repeal as well. Uh, it's on the agenda, actually. Uh, Justice Thomas, in his concurring opinion with uh, Alito on the Dobbs decision, said that, yeah, we should also be talking about contraception uh, and access to contraception as well. It's just crazy. It wants to go back to 1958, it wants to go back to a time before uh, all of these rights uh, had been kind of enshrined. Uh, into our constitutional framework uh, by the courts of the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and on. So it's a it's a it's a historic challenge. There's never been a time like this. Uh, it's an illegitimate Supreme Court. Um, uh, the Federalist Society has handpicked these judges, and they're going to go systematically through every single area of American life, pull up a case from below, most likely from southern states, from Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and then they're going to rule six to three to repeal uh, a statute uh, under which we've lived for generations. You brought up Clarence Thomas. Uh, the joke has always been, and for years at the Roberts Court, uh, that they're bought and paid for by, by big moneyed interest. Uh, we're now finally seeing in public uh, that I guess what I've learned from Clarence Thomas is I've got the wrong friends. Uh, I've, ne I've never had anyone buy my buy me real estate or take me on you know half a million dollar vacations or pay my kids tuition. Um, you know this to me is a, a real problem that is is still not being addressed. Uh, is there a way forward on on holding these justices accountable even while we're talking about expanding the court? Well, I believe that Justice Thomas should resign. Obviously. Uh, and I believe that there should be an adoption of a real code of conduct on the Supreme Court. But and if they don't, I believe that Congress should impose a code of conduct on them. Now here's because the thing, Senator. Here's my problem. Um, you know, this this idea that I, I didn't know how to fill out the form or I was told I didn't have to. If I fill out a government form improperly, if I you know make these these statements, things bad things happen to me. And, you know, look, I'm not a Supreme Court justice, uh, but saying that the forms, well, were, seems seems like a reach to me uh, where the average everyday working person is going, hey, there'd be there'd be consequences for me if I if I did this probably going to jail. Why doesn't it apply to someone like Thomas? Uh, precisely. So we are, thanks to Justice Thomas and his wife, Jeannie Thomas, we're in that discussion, really a needed discussion in our country. And. Uh, and I think that we can give them, you know, the opportunity to put together their own code of of conduct at all of the federal judicial ju judiciary levels below the Supreme Court. There is a code of conduct. Uh, and and if they don't, I think it's time for us to have that debate. No. And minutes. the other part of this is I, I'm sure you saw the CNN uh, Trump thing that was happened the other day at the town hall where Trump came out and admitted, hey, that, that row thing. I did that. I'm the one who overturned Roe because I got you three justices. Is there, a, is there a moment where we go, you know, all three of those people came and perjured themselves in front of the Senate? Because I got to assume that they made it for Trump to make that kind of claim. He had to have assurances that these folks were on the right page. Well, look at people think that Supreme Court justices serve for life, but actually they serve uh, for good behavior. Uh, the problem is to remove a justice would require, um, you know, two thirds most likely uh, of the uh, Senate in order to accomplish that goal. Uh, and uh, at this particular point in time, that's not going to be possible. Yeah. What will be possible is for us to inject all of these issues into the 2024 election cycle uh, so that everything is on the table and the Supreme Court will be the ultimate arbiter of whether or not those rights, those protections for all Americans and all aspects of their lives are protected. Especially, my father was a union guy. My father was a, a local vice president of an electrical union. He used to he used to uh, hold up his finger that got uh, cut off uh, when he was a young man working in a factory, and he'd go, Eddie, Eddie, that was before OSHA, you know? 
that was before Osha. Then he'd have actually he'd have another finger that he do in order to uh, describe how he felt about pre, you know, pre OSHA, pre labor protections that were put on the books. All of it, all those safety laws, all those uh, wage protections, all of those, you know, are all going to be on the table at the Supreme Court. So we can't, as you said, we can't agonize. We have to organize. Yes, sir. You know, it That's brings up, reminds me of an interesting story. Last summer, we did a uh, a working class heroes radio tour, and we were up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and we went to one of the coal mine tours. And the guy was talking about the working conditions there and how you know they were working in knee deep of muck and feces and and horrible stuff, and the conditions were just deplorable. And a woman behind me goes, "Where was OSHA?" Uh, because we've become so accustomed to having these things that people never understood or never it never dawned on her that there was a before OSHA, uh, which I found very interesting. Last line of questioning I've got for you, because on the labor rights front is where I spend most of my time. Uh, I've been saying for since Roberts came around that their their goal is to take us back to the Lochner era. Uh, to where if you're desperate enough and hungry enough to work for poverty wages, uh, if we're de- in deplorable conditions, hey, that's your freedom. That's your liberty to go and do. And I see incrementally us moving back that way. Janice uh, took you know union rights away from, uh, from the public sector workers. Uh, Concepcion did the whole uh, forced arbitration stuff. There's case after case after case going against working people. I don't know that we spend enough time talking about that. I think that's something we should be really highlighting more. Uh, my father always used to say, Eddie, you can't beg for your rights. You got to take them. You got to fight for them. Uh, so everyone should understand it's all on the table with the Supreme Court. Every June from now until we expand the court are going to be ripping away these rights, yeah. these protections. For so what do we do? What, what's, what's the marching order? What do we do tomorrow? What do we do right now? We need a Democratic House. We need a Democratic Senate. We need to keep Joe Biden in. Then we need to expand the court. We can do it if we there um, you go. instruct uh, that. And so that means 2024 decision time because this illegitimate far right wing Supreme Court is aiming at every one of these rights and protections. And because it's corporations that created this entire heritage foundation uh leonard leo world out there they're principally aiming at the protections which workers have uh, received from corporations over the years uh through legislation or through court decisions so um so it's all on the line and i just hope that your listeners understand this this is the moment the existential moment we have to keep Joe Biden. We got to get back four, five more seats in the House, hold on to the Senate, and then let's just do what needs to be done. We cannot allow the bullies to continue to take our lunch money. We got to fight with the same intensity, the same passion that they do. And your listeners are those people. They are the workers. They are the fighters. Uh, they are the people who know that the unions built the middle class in our country. And right now, the Supreme Court is intent on taking away all of those protections, all of those uh, guarantees uh, that have been put on the books over all of these past decades. Senator, I appreciate the time. Uh, I hope you'll come back and share some more thoughts with us down the line. And best of luck getting this through, something we desperately need. Thanks so much. Love being with you. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. Uh, Senator Ed Markey. Check out that website, markey.senate.gov. We'll get links out on social media. I can do that. Take a quick break. Right back after this. Stick around. Listen to The Rick Smith Show. We're working people from the talk. From the steel mills of Pennsylvania, to the auto factories of Michigan, to the modern makers movement, manufacturing makes our nation great. I'm Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We bring business and labor together to advocate for policies that everyone can agree on. Together, we can strengthen manufacturing and create good paying American jobs. Help us keep it made in America. We are AFGE. We support our nation's military and our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders and provide services to our nation's seniors across the country and here in Washington, D.C., the American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. The old factory towns in America's heartland have been taking a beating. Thing is, though, 
there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The new CHIPS bill that got passed will bring jobs back home and has already resulted in big announcements of major new factories opening. The American Recovery Package has allowed cities and counties to hire new police officers and firefighters and start rebuilding their communities again. We're finally turning things around after 40 years of screwing over working people. But will we keep moving in the right direction? That's our choice. Get to a couple of quick emails. Carl, listening on KTNF in Minneapolis, says, Rick, I didn't hear you once mention Carl, Clarence Thomas, and all of the ethical scandals he is involved in. Doesn't this alone render the court illegitimate? And, and look, as I said, you know, if it were any one of us, if it were you, if it were me, if we we screwed up these forms, if we just said, you know, hey, someone told me I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> they, they, they'd feed and house and clothe us. Uh, that's what they would do. The reward for doing that would be a residence. Uh, it'd be small, cramped. You'd probably have a roommate, uh, but you know, you three cots, uh, three hots and a cot. Uh, there's, there's, there's no chance Thomas is going to be held accountable for all of the, the stuff that he's done. And, and I don't know what reasonable person looks at what Clarence pa- Thomas did and say, oh, that's okay. I don't know that how he can justify it. Uh, understand, you know, I, I don't know how you go. Yeah, I, I took a half a million dollar vacation because uh, he's my buddy. He's my friend. Uh, he you know, lets me use his yacht whenever. You know, it's, it's kind of like your neighbor letting you use the yard rake. Same thing, you know, multi-million dollar yachts, you know, leaf blower. It's same thing. You know, it, it, it just it's just how it is. Uh, I, but then again, my neighbor never paid for my kids tuition either. Uh, never bought real estate to to improve. I, I mean, there's there's so much here that you go. How could anybody look at what Thomas has done and not and not say he's got to go? Uh, and and his wife is a whole nother monster story. Uh, the, the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that have been funneled to her from these right wing groups. I know, I know. As I've been told. It's this incestuous pool in which they live. They're not buying their access. They're just, they're treating their friends well. They have, they're good friends. They want to see their friends do well. Now, look, the Supreme Court situation we're in, you can thank the organization. And I keep coming back to this, and, and Senator Markey brought it up too. Uh, Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society and, and the organizing that conservatives have been doing, big moneyed interests have been doing for decades in from from high school from from you know first year in college all the way through law school creating an environment where they're grooming the next justices the next people who are going to sit on the bench it's all about feeding it's it's all about feeding them and very very well I guess, you know, look, who could turn down a half a million dollar vacation? I had someone ask me, would you turn it down? I'm like, no, of course not. What am I, an idiot? But there's a difference between me, a guy sitting behind a microphone on the radio, and a sitting U.S. Supreme Court justice who has the the hopes, the dreams, the legitimacy, the, the faith of 350-some million people. And he's betrayed them. Seems simple. Uh, Brian also sent me an email, said public trust in the institution of the Supreme Court has been plummeting. Combine their decisions on voting rights, money and politics, and then taking away Roe with the attempted insurrection and Trump saying he's going to pardon the insurrectionists if reelected. This feels like it's an aspect of a larger slide towards extremism in this country. Do you think? Uh, we've been seeing this kind of extremism. You know, if you go back to 92 and you go, you know, Pat Buchanan's speeches were better in their original German. That was kind of a slide away from, you know, con- you know conservative thought of the day. We have jumped the shark uh, again and again and again. This is like a, a hurtling of the sharks of how far this Republican Party has gone from even the Buchanan era. So this idea that that the court has legitimacy left, sorry, I'm not buying it. So how do we save it? Uh, a conservative would tell me, got to kill it. 
That's what my conservative friends say. You got to kill it to save it, much like the argument for about Social Security. The only way we can save Social Security is if we you know, change everything about it, destroy it all. What do you think? Uh, I I, I got to tell you, I'm I'm I don't have great hope for this court. And unless we get our heads collectively around the idea that elections matter, uh, because I remember the, the 2016 election. I remember walking the line of voters ready to vote and having conservative after crazy MAGA hat wearing uh, nutcase tell me it's all about the Supreme Court. Don't care about any of Trump's problems. It's all about the Supreme Court. Why? Because they knew they had been they had been trained by right wing media to understand the court is where the power is. Changing the laws to justify your crimes, that's, that's, oh, oh, that's where the, pro- the power is. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the I've been driving buses for five years, and my day-to-day routine is I wake up a little earlier than most people. I get on a bus, I go out, I pick up some students and make sure they get to school nice and safe. Here in Fairbanks, Alaska, that can be a challenge because of the winter weather and the icy roads but I love the job. So the Teamsters are great. They provide us a lot of protections. They've always taken care of their people, made sure that our jobs were secure. We didn't have to worry about whether or not we'd have a job from day to day. Uh, And that's amazing because before, we'd be working four, six, eight hours a day, and only earning minimum wage was real difficult to make a living. Then the Teamsters pushed the law, so we make something we can live off of and not have to have a second job. What absolutely gives me peace of mind, the, the union membership allows me to focus on this job without having to worry about whether or not my family is going to be taken care of. I'm Andrew Case, and I'm proud to be Teamsters Local 959. Before we close the program, we want to take a moment to thank our viewers and to share a little bit about why we do what we do. At The Rick Smith Show, we believe that media today is almost entirely controlled by corporate greed. So we have now 24-hour news channels. But instead of 24 hours of news, what we get is one hour repeated 24 times and with, with tons of commercials creating obscene amounts of profits. Information once presented as a public service has now become a private commodity. So when lies make money, lies, lies are what we get. We get a corporate-controlled rage machine feeding us anger and hate, trying to convince us that our problems are right-left or red-blue when they are and always have been up-down, the wealthiest 1% versus the rest of us. Our goal is is to be an alternative to that machine. Not as a news show with a fancy journalist out front, but as a talk show run by a union truck driver and a team of working class heroes just like you. Everything we do, both what we get right and what we get wrong, is dedicated to advancing the interests of America's working families. No corporate ad buys, no think tanks, no focus groups, no talking points. We are media by working people for working people. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here next time.